welcome back to chapter 12 of I, Freddy. As I expect you know, said Sir William, we cats can see in the dark. He paused, widening his eyes so they glowed even brighter. I've been watching you for quite a while. Quite a while? Had I, without knowing it, been subject to some kind of test? I glanced around at Enrico and Caruso, but they seemed to be waiting in silence for whatever would happen next. With a jerk of his head, Sir William signaled to me to follow and led the way into the study, which was lighter than the living room. As I followed that enormous black tomcat through the gloom, I couldn't help feeling rather uneasy despite myself. Once in the study, Sir William came to a halt. I'll be brief, he said. You really scared Enrico and Caruso just now. Hamsters are capable of looking warlike, but guinea pigs are defenseless creatures. Do you know what your type of behavior is called? He looked at me as if expecting an answer, so I shook my head. Bullying, bullying he said. That's what it's called. He spread his paws so the claws protruded. Just so we understand each other. There's a rule in Mr. John's home, and that rule is no bullying. Great. So what did he, he call those jokers song? Do I make myself clear? Asked Mr. William. I nodded. He evidently thought it was quite all right for the guinea pigs to provoke me, so I held my tongue. After all, I wanted something out of the big cat. Good, said Mr. William, Sir William. That's settled then. And now, my friend, tell me why you wanted a word with me. Heaven alone knew, had there been the slightest chance of coping with the problem on my own, I would have simply left him standing there. As it was, I said, I have a problem, Sir William. I'd very much like it to write with Mr. John's typewriter, but I'm not strong enough to use it. You want to write? Sir William eyed me keenly. Then he smiled. Behold, our expert on the written word. He only feels happy when he's messing around with letters and so on. Very praiseworthy of you, if you'll pardon my saying so. However, it betrays a rather one-tracked mind. I was positively fascinated by Sir William's display of superiority, but I kept my temper. I hardly think, I said, that it betrays a one-track mind to want to get in touch with, with Mr. John. Oh, he regarded me thoughtfully. Is that really what you're after? Hmm. He glanced at the desk with the typewriter on it. Very well. Then we'd better take a look, hadn't we? He lowered his head. On you get. I climbed onto his head, hung on tight with my teeth, and we landed beside the machine. Getting down on the desktop, I rose on my hind legs. It was just as I had foreseen. Each of the round keys bore a single letter. I placed one forepaw on the X and the other on the Y. You have to press them down one at a time, I said. That way, you can string whole words together. I'm not entirely unaware of that, my friend, said Mr. Sir Williams, excuse me. And now I imagine you're hoping I'll press the key down for you. Am I right? I nod nodded, quite startled. It was all going swell, far better than I'd expected. It would be tremendously kind of you, I said. He gave me a thoughtful look. There are only two snags. In the first place, I'm not an expert on the written word, as you know. No problem there. I'll show you which keys to press. Hmm. Even if I went along with that, there's still the second snag. Look. Sir William placed his right forepaw on the keyboard. It covered not only the H in the center, but the G on the left, and the J on the right, and the B in the end below. I stared at his huge paw, feeling rather foolish. Quite clearly, the typewriter wasn't designed for it. I should have thought of that, of course. Then I had an idea. Your claws, I exclaimed. You could punch the keys with one of your claws. 
Sir William shook his head. I can't put them out one at a time, I'm afraid. And besides, I would never run the risk, to be frank. If my claws snapped off, I would lose my identity. You'd lose your what? My identity. I wouldn't be myself anymore. Even a civilized Tom is still a Tom, but a clawless Tom is just a pussycat. He was right, I guess. But that wasn't my problem, so what now? How could I press those keys down? Well, fancy that. Freddy the expert has run out of ideas, Sir William smirked. I'm surprised you haven't t hit on the obvious solution. Which is? I asked, genuinely excited now. We simply lengthen the keys. With a cork, for instance, I'm sure there will be one in the trash can. You stand the cork on the relevant key and hold it in position while, while, while you press down on it. I get it. Bingo. That was it. He'd solved my writing problem in an instant. yippee doo I cried out. I leaped into the air and turned a somersault before landing. I can write! So it seems. Sir William's smile suddenly vanished. That's to say, he added gravely, you could write. He paused. If I cooperated. W what? What do you mean? I mean I won't. He looked at me. I won't help you write. But! My plans collapsed like a house of cards. Why on earth not? Sir William had said nothing for a while, just stared at the keyboard. Then he turned away. Because it wouldn't be right, he said. What wouldn't be right? I demanded rather sharply of him. The mighty Tomcat had evidently decided that it was beneath his dignity to assist a smart but very diminutive rodent. It was time to redetermine the relationship between physical strength and intellectual ability. It wouldn't be right to establish contact with a human? What? The old gentleman had startled, started talking nonsense, it seemed. You must be joking, I said angrily. You make it clear to Mr. John when you're hungry. If that isn't establishing contact, what is? I don't like your tone, my little friend, said Sir William. You're right. I do establish contact with him, but I do so in my own way. I purr or meow. What you have in mind is a form of contact established by human means, and that isn't right. Why should one be right and not the other? I asked, controlling myself with an effort. Because it's beneath an animal's dignity. It's undignified even to imitate a human. Take those animals in zoos that beg for food by waving their paws around. As for trying to communicate with humans in their own language, that's positively reprehensible. What are the most pathetic creatures in the world? Huh, I thought to myself, talking parrots? But Sir William, if only I could use that typewriter, uh, that's enough. I refuse to discuss it further. Sir William frowned and then suddenly yawned. <sighs> I must be off to my blanket and you to your burrow. All right, on you get. I was back in my cage before I knew it. Good night said Sir William, shutting the door with a click. He jumped off the bookshelf and disappeared. I sat there, utterly defeated. There were no two ways around it. I couldn't do any writing. Melancholy overcame me once more, but this time I fought back. Get lost, I told it. And when Melancholy asked what right I had to send it packing, I said, in the first place, I know how writing works in principle. That's a great deal in itself. Second, I know Sir William is wrong. Even a wise tomcat's powers of imagination are limited, and Sir William is extremely narrow-minded, at least where the subjects of contact with humans is concerned. Third, I've decided not to let every last little setback cast me down into a bottomless pit of despair. Stay cool. That's still the order of the day. Next, I gave myself a pep talk. Okay, Freddy, I said. You may not be able to write, 
but you can still read. There are books all around you, right, left, above, below, enough books to last a hamster's lifetime. You're in a book lover's paradise, so get reading. It worked. I shelved the subject of writing, so to speak, and turned to that of reading. And then, as if anything more were needed to keep my keep me on my toes, I was promptly confronted by the need to solve a rather fundamental problem. The books were standing upright in rows, side by side. How could I maneuver the book I wanted to read into position where I could turn the pages? More to the point, how could I do so without alerting Mr. John? Sir William had been absolutely right about one thing. Mr. John mustn't discover my pencil. After all, who could tell when I might need it in an emergency? I told away all evening, but in vain. I was simply too small and too weak to pull a book out, let alone lay it down flat. I didn't give up, though. The next morning, or the next evening, excuse me, I set to work again. Suddenly, Sir William appeared on the shelf beside me. I don't object to you reading, he said. So tell me which book you're after. I pointed to one at random. Sir William laid the book on its side and opened it. If I hear Mr. John coming, he said, I'll jump up and put it back. I nodded, and he jumped down again. The book was called The Foresight Saga. It was bound to contain plenty of reading matter, being one of the thickest, and it appeared to be about a human family whose members were always getting on one another's nerves. Very appropriate, I thought, recalling my time with Sophie, Gregory, and Mom. Part one, I read. Chapter one, at home, at old Jolson's. That was the start of a wonderfully stimulating journey through the, my book lover's paradise. Every evening, when Mr. John had left the apartment, as he did almost every evening, the same thing happened. Sir William jumped onto the bookshelf, pried open my cage drawer with his claws, which saved me from having to get the pencil out, opened whichever book I pointed to, and disappeared. The next two or three hours were my own. I sat at the foot of the book and devoured page after page in the dim but adequate light that filtered through the study window. It was terribly slow going at first, I have to admit, especially as the Foresight Saga was very tough fare for a beginner to read. However, once I had learned to read on, instead of getting bogged down in passages that resisted my powers of comprehension, I became quite as skilled at reading as Mr. John himself. I tackled one book after another. My evening sessions regularly ended the way Sir William had predicted. As soon as he heard Mr. John on the stairs, Sir William jumped up beside me, replaced the book, and closed my cage door. Sometimes you turned up early. Well, my friend, he would say, still hard at it. Take care you don't ruin your eyesight. Sir William was fond of shooting the breeze with me. When I told him what I happened to be reading, he would listen a while, then shake his head and say, Amazing how much a little rodent's head can hold. He not only looked upon my reading as the pastime of a, an eccentric expert, but tolerated it, and patiently as he tolerated Enrico's and Caruso's wisecracks. I saw no reason to climb down from my bookshelf, so I never set eyes on the guinea pigs during the, this period. I heard them, though, because they performed their song from time to time. Although I still involuntarily bared my teeth them at them whenever I heard it, I was becoming hardened to their jokes at my expense. But then they started playing games. It happened after Sophia had paid me a visit. That's the end of chapter 12. See, us, see you next time for chapter 13.